Tonight, two teens shot in the East End. This as another community is still reeling one day after shots are fired in an apartment hallway. It's terrifying, like there's little kids around here. Shocking video shows the suspects inside the apartment shooting at five teenagers and a high-tech project on the city shoreline passes another hurdle. Waterfront Toronto will begin formal evaluations on plans for the so-called smart city. Plus, <laughs> it's Halloween night. We head to a haunted maze to meet some brave guys and ghouls. But first, we start with breaking news. Toronto police say two male teenagers are suffering from serious injuries after a shooting near Cosburn and Pape. Kelda Yoon is live on the scene tonight. Kelda, what can you tell us? Well, Talia, I can tell you that the shooting happened in this apartment building behind me. A police got the call just after 9 o'clock, and when they got here, they found two male teens behind this uh, building. Uh, they were both shot in the torso. Police say that there were three shots in total. Both of them were rushed to hospital in serious condition, but they are now believed to be in stable condition. Now, the suspect, uh, he is believed to be a white male, also in his teens or early 20s, and he was seen fleeing on foot and so police are continuing to be they're going to be here through the night and they'll be canvassing the scene hoping to talk to uh, possible witnesses who may have seen what happened now this is just the latest in a string of shootings in the city over the past few days there was a shooting earlier today that left one man injured and last night a shooting near Eglinton and Keel left five teens injured and I was there earlier today. I spoke to some trick or treaters who told me that uh, there is definitely some added fear after what happened. It was a quiet night along this stretch of Clearview Heights Drive north of Eglinton. The scene of the shooting all but cleared, but the fear remains. Karen and her 13 year old daughter Emma, two of the few trick or treaters seen out tonight. They live across from the building where the shooting happened. So we're just trying to bypass as fast as we can. I do not want that to happen to me. What happened was caught on video. Obtained by CBC News, it shows three suspects in the building's stairwell. One is seen firing shots into a hallway. The five victims, two girls and three boys, range from 16 to 18 years old. About 20 shots were fired at them, but all are expected to live. I think they, they need to do, put even higher security in this corner. Police are continuing to look for the three suspects believed to be in their late teens and early 20s. They fled in a black sedan. I think it'll be hard to keep this one a secret. I really do. But police will have their hands full. This morning, less than three kilometers away, another shooting. A 29-year-old man was shot in the parking lot right next to a community center and daycare. Like rapid fire, like just multiple shots. It's a scary sound. It really is. They're thinking they could be linked together, so now it makes me even more scared. Toronto police are looking into a possible link as they search for the two suspects who also fled in a black vehicle. Anti-gun violence advocate Louis March says he'd like to see more money spent on youth programming and figuring out the root of the gun violence. There's a level of fear and despair right now that we've never seen before. When you're talking to the... Uh, today was supposed to be the last day of Project Community Space, an intelligence-led effort by P Toronto police to try to curb gun and gang violence. But after this, this string of shootings, uh, Toronto Police Chief Mark Saunders says that this tr Project Community Space will be extended indefinitely. And meanwhile, here, police are, some officers, numerous officers are still here. The K-9 unit is still here. They'll be canvassing the area. Police also say that since it was Halloween night, uh, it's assumed that Many people were out this evening when this shooting happened, and they're hoping that witnesses will come forward. I'll send it back to you, Talia. Thanks, Calda. The mayor is reacting to the shootings as well, saying he's disturbed by them, but adding there's no easy fix. 
I wish I could stand in front of the public and say that I had a magic answer to this and that there was one thing we could do and that would solve everything. Uh, but whether I talk to the chief, whether I talk to other law enforcement experts, whether I talk to my colleagues, um, everybody's honest enough to say there isn't that one answer. And so we will just have to proceed forward to do the things that we're doing and try and, uh, you know, redouble our efforts to make sure we bring people to justice, that we get guns off the street, that we invest in the neighborhoods uh, and provide support for the police who are out there doing their very best. John Tory says he's going to continue to push for a national handgun ban and changes to bail laws. But in the meantime, police need the help of the public to find the shooters. The Sidewalk Labs development for Keyside now has the green light from Waterfront Toronto, moving it forward for closer study and public consultation. But the company's new deal came with concessions. City Hall reporter Lauren Pelly has the story. It's a plan that could transform a chunk of Toronto's eastern waterfront into a high-tech smart city. There's sort of incredible access to the water. The Google sister company behind the Keyside project says it would feature new technologies for pedestrian safety and energy efficiency while collecting data on everyday life to foster future innovations. But the latest version of the plan is far less ambitious than before. Yeah, we had to compromise, but the end of the day, um, not in a way that we think jeopardizes the ultimate objective of this, which is to try and create a new model for inclusive growth. This morning, Waterfront Toronto's board voted unanimously to move the project forward for deeper review and public <laughs> consultation, but only after Sidewalk Labs scaled it back from 190 acres to this smaller site at the foot of Parliament Street. And the project has clearly been defined as an initial phase as being the 12 acres of Keysight only. The American company also agreed to make sure any personal data collected is stored and processed in Canada. It's a concession amid ongoing controversy over the possible impact on privacy. We all know that people are afraid to express themselves and to take out controversial positions if they feel like they're going to be watched. Still, the new agreement marks a win for city officials. I've always wanted to see this happen because I've always believed, and you didn't see me ever saying it was anything other than an exciting opportunity, but it has to happen on the right terms in the right way. Based on the significant changes that, wa that Sidewalk Labs have agreed to, I'm now optimistic that we can get to yes. Waterfront Toronto warns more concerns and questions could arise in the months ahead. This is not yet a done deal. There is still further work to be done before a final decision is made. That decision on this smart city's fate will be made next March. Lauren Pelly, CBC News, Toronto. A group of students at Secord Elementary got into the Halloween spirit today. Their school was transformed into a spooky Halloween haunt. Our camera was there as they made their way through the halls. I know there's a human being in there. This is our second annual Halloween Howl, where we've invited uh, the community uh, before school began. Yes. Good job. It's Kai. It's Kai. Sky. We've decorated the gym uh, in a very spooky, haunted uh, scene. Uh, kids are really excited to be down here because they love celebrating Halloween. Our community loves celebrating Halloween. Classes have been coming down. Uh, we've decorated the gym. Uh, it's been uh, done by some dedicated student volunteers and parent volunteers. It's like a very creepy thing. They made this to scare us, but we we didn't get scared. Like because because they didn't put like so much thing, so much like so much scariness on this thing. So really, it wasn't that scared. Candy, candy is the best. Yeah, candy is the best. 
Meteorologist Colette <laughs> Kennedy joins us now for a first look at our forecasts and unfortunately really not the best night for these trick-or-treaters. No, it really wasn't because of some of the wet conditions, although I think when candy's involved it gets everyone's spirits True. elevated and just fine. But now, you know, it's mostly while our trick-or-treaters hopefully long in bed and the rest of us soon to go to bed, these winds will be howling. They are ramping up right now. It's a true Hallow's Eve. In terms of we have the special weather statement still for all of southern and eastern Ontario. It includes the GTA, but the wind warnings for the areas you see in orange, and we're starting to see those winds really coming in. So for Port Colborne, for example, this last hour, sustained winds over 90 kilometers an hour. The gusts over 105 towards St. Catharines, over 70 kilometers an hour. Pearson, just over 60, but City Centre Airport reporting some of those wind gusts up to 80 kilometers an hour already. So these are going to continue overnight and be strong into tomorrow morning. Temperature 7 degrees at Toronto, but look at Windsor has come down to 2. That cold air will be filtering in, so anything left, and there is some moisture left here as that cold air moves in and those winds, it means even some of these flurries, not just light showers, but flurries making their way towards the GTA. That'll be something to watch, uh, but again, the real concern here with these winds, these are the current gusts, but as they ramp up overnight, and we'll look at those projections coming up a little later in the show, Talia, but as they ramp up the concern will be if there are going to be any power lines or things that get pulled down or our ground is very saturated so that can pull even some trees down if you've got some uh, roots that are vulnerable things like that well that's definitely a spooky forecast thanks it for is. that call it you're welcome we all know how tough it is looking for a new job or going for that interview. This job fair is geared specifically to refugees. I'm Natalie Nanowski and I'll have more on just how successful the fair was coming up. The former owner of College Street Bar is back in court telling his side of the story. Gavin McMillan and his manager are on trial, charged with gang sexual assault. A warning, some of the details are graphic. The alleged victim said she was raped by the two men, but McMillan sees it differently. The 44-year-old told the courtroom the sex was rough but 100% consensual. He told the jury the woman asked for a threesome and the woman was smiling and enjoying the sex. In cross-examination, McMillan watched video of the woman staggering back to the bar and the Crown challenged McMillan's claim she gave consent. Some dramatic 911 calls were heard in an Oshawa courtroom today. Just some of the evidence in the trial of a Toronto police officer and his brother. They're facing assault and obstructing justice charges in the almost three-year-old beating of Defonte Miller. Lorenda Redekop was in the courtroom and a warning some of the images in this story are disturbing. This is what Devonte Miller's eye looked like that night. Shown in a police evidence photo introduced in this trial. 
A metal pipe around a meter long was found at the scene on a street in Whitby near where Miller lived. His lawyer has said he was beaten by that pipe. Today, a forensic pathologist testified Miller had a rupture to his left eyeball. Dr. Michael Pickup described that as bursting from the inside out, comparing it to a water balloon bursting under pressure. Christian Terrio made the first 911 call that night. Here are pieces of it. We caught guys trying to break into our cars. How many? Oh, we caught one of them. Right, grab them. Is this your residence or is this? Mike, arrest them. They're off duty cops. He says his brother is restraining the person. At one point, Michael Terrio takes the phone. How many people uh, were breaking into the car? Two. We're missing one. Devonte Miller also calls 911. Michael Terrio's voice can be heard during it. It's 911. Hello. Hello. Stop. The third call from neighbors. Jim Silverthorne and his wife. He's a longtime Toronto fire employee, awakened by people fighting on his front lawn. They're on our front lawn right now. There's some people on our front lawn. So he said the guy who thought he was going to kick our door in, but he was yelling, call 911. Among the evidence photos, blood on his front door and yard. Seriously, the one guy's got a stick. Multiple times, he asks about progress of the police. The operator says this. It looks like maybe the one guy was trying to break into the other guy's car there. Well, so. it, yeah, yeah, I know, but it's, I don't know that. Lawyers for the Terrio brothers cross-examined the pathologist, and he said it's possible injuries were not caused by the pipe. The court also heard from an expert in Toronto police training. Retired Deputy Chief Mike Federico said officers are taught to use reasonable force in restraining someone. And he said that can include the use of weapons. He said that officers are told to avoid strikes to the head if possible. The trial continues tomorrow. Lorenda Redekop, CBC News, Oshawa. Landing a job is easier said than done, and if you're new to the country, that comes with its own fair share of challenges. Now some Toronto organizations are banding together to help. Natalie Nanowski explains. For months, Miriam Ajuya was handing out her resume, always getting the same response. They said, okay, you just came to Canada, you don't have any experience at all. It was the same for Taniola Nobanjo, who fled Nigeria last year. A man that's really way older than me, like almost like the age of my grandfather, so I was supposed to get married to him, and I didn't have peace with that. Now, after attending Toronto's refugee hiring fair, both women have job offers. This um, um, event today gave me an opportunity to meet with the employers one-on-one. -on -one. Making the process easier for newcomers is near and dear to this senator's heart. I remember my first job interview in Canada. I came as someone who had to flee one country and seek safety in another. And I can only remember the nervousness, the anxiety. The day-long event included some training and interview prep. Getting ready for the Canadian job market uh, with all its written and unwritten rules is, is, is a challenge because things are done differently. Here. We did a lot of work with them and the employers today have recognized that and said they're so well prepared and that means that they get to move right into an employment. In total, 15 employers came out, everyone from Starbucks to FedEx to Ikea. And between all of them, they put up 100 positions that they want filled immediately. So I'm on to the next stage. The response was incredible and we have a wait list which has brought us to plan another event. So we have several employers who are just waiting for that date. The hope is to bring similar refugee job fairs to cities across the country. Natalie Nanowski, CBC News, Toronto.
An Etobicoke special effects studio is busy making props for TV shows and movies, things like severed limbs and dead bodies. In the spirit of Halloween, we took a tour of the studio and found out what they're, what they're making is so realistic, they've actually had the police called on them twice. If you come through here, you're going to see a lot of monsters, creatures. You're going to see a lot of dead bodies. Um, we do a lot of surgery shows, things like that. Here, you're going to see organs, guts, that right there. And that's a gut mat. Do you go, we want to see that? Yeah, let's go see the gut mat. That's what you look like on the inside. Cool. So when we do stuff like that, there is a lot of research to know where the lungs are, where the heart would be, where the liver, the intestines. And we can bend them into position if we have to. Once we have all the pieces together, it's almost like a puzzle. What are some of the shows or movies that you've worked on? Um, here we've done uh, everything from The Handmaid's Tale, The Expanse, Umbrella Academy, and many others. <laughs> Can you tell me a bit about the times that people kind of misunderstood what you do here? Twice this year we've had uh, tactical police called because we were moving some of our um, dead bodies and cadavers and stuff uh, in body bags to our storage unit. Just the most recent time, somebody from a um, mobile app company called the police because they saw a bunch of severed body parts and limbs and stuff and mummies on the ground. You know, he saw right away what was going on and what we do. He saw, you know, creature heads and, you know, so he called off the other four um, police officers that were on their way. So do people call you and they're like, hey, we need a face that's been shot in the cheek. Can you make that happen? Like, how do those conversations work? Yes, they, they do that all the time. We're often making things that we've never made before. You never know what somebody's gonna bring to the table, something like that. I need someone shot in the cheek and I need it to bleed on camera. Who's this guy here? This is a head from the Umbrella Academy. And we made this head because in the scene, they had to pull out this guy's oh! eyeball. <laughs> Gross. And then they comped it onto the actor's face. Oh, wow. We use a lot of these generic bodies sometimes in movies. They need like dead bodies in the background. Give him his eyes, give him his teeth. I don't think he doesn't have a tongue, this one. I got into this from uh, watching sci fi movies uh, Star Wars, Planet of the Apes, anything like that, horror movies, The Fly. Um, so when I saw these movies, I just thought when I grow up, I just want to be around creatures and monsters. And then when you see your effect on camera, that's when it really sells it. And I love watching people's reactions. You know, you see somebody get stabbed in the eye, blood come out, and everyone freaks out. That's my favorite part. And Colette's back with our extended forecast. Colette, hoping it's not scarier than that. Well, it's pretty scary <laughs> in terms of what we're, yeah, not scarier than that though, uh, what we're seeing with our winds. So they really are ramping up even since uh, just the start of the show. When I was here earlier, we're finding now the winds at city center in Toronto airport are almost up to 85 kilometers an hour in terms of the gusts. And as I mentioned earlier, Port Colborne coming in with some wind gusts over 105 kilometers an hour. So very strong winds through the overnight into tomorrow morning. So still tomorrow morning's commute if you drive a high profile vehicle and even just getting the kids ready for school if you can get them up after uh, their sugar highs and sleep tonight we're going to be still seeing those winds up there in the morning hours at possibly over 80 kilometers an hour and then they'll begin to ease as we move through the day on Friday so they'll improve into the afternoon but boy some windy conditions and these are damaging winds so we'll be watching to see if we get any power lines coming down or anything like that now what's happening as well is as the cold front's making its way through the showery activity is turning into some flurry or light snowfall activity Activity. You can see it's two degrees now, not just in Windsor, but Sarnia as well as that cold front works its way through. Still hanging on at seven here in Toronto, nine in Oshawa. Those lines, areas of barometric pressure, when they get close together like this, yeah, we're talking about those winds really firing up. They will start to ease. As I say, it takes some time, but in less than 24 hours, they'll be coming up. But still some flurries into our forecast. We'll certainly... Uh, for the 1st of November, have to get used to that, right? Getting into flurry activity. Look at those overnight lows, southwestern Ontario, right there near the freezing mark. Highs tomorrow with a mix of sun and cloud, five, six degrees, the best we can do. And into the GTA we go, where we're looking at one to two, maybe even three degrees for St. Catharines in terms of your overnight temperatures. And again, the highs tomorrow, just five to six degrees is all we'll be seeing. 
If there is a piece of good news in here, it's this weekend. We get to see those clocks fall back. So that is coming our way Saturday night into Sunday. Uh, but what we're not seeing is much of a warm up in those temperatures. I'll focus on the good news. Thanks, Colette. You're welcome. Trick-or-treaters are not the only ones enjoying a tasty snack this Halloween. The Toronto Zoo held a pumpkin party for some of its residents. Some seem to enjoy it, others not sure what to do with it. A happy Halloween to all of the animals out there. Looks delicious, but I'm sure there's something a little more chocolatey on everyone's menu for the next few days. That's it for us tonight. We'll leave you with images of trick-or-treaters near Gerard and Coxwell earlier this evening. Good night.